everybody, um, welcome to this magnificent gallery for this special um, event marking the end of the celebratory sesquicent sesqui I'll get it right in a minute, sesquicentennial of the National Secular Society, that's the 150th anniversary. Um, we started out by commissioning um, a portrait bust of Bradlaugh, which was completed by a fabulous artist called Susie Zanet. And Keith was very active in promoting this in Parliament to a parliamentary committee, trying to get it installed in the House of Parliament, and eventually succeeded in doing so. And if you want to see it at its prominent position in the House of Parliament, it's uh, just past the uh, central lobby, if you ever get there. And so now it's available for parliamentarians, visitors to Parliament, and indeed future generations will be reminded at last of Bradlaugh's significance. And I'm glad that Bradlaugh at last got the recognition in that very place that he fought so hard to reform. Um, and now it's wonderful that we're ending this celebration year in Manchester with the rehanging of the uh, portrait, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen at the top of the stairs outside, by Walter Sickert of Bradlaugh, the Bar of the House of Commons. Um, and we're very thrilled that uh, our historian, Mr. Forder, has managed to persuade the gallery to drag this portrait out of the cellars where it's been stored for generations and rehang it in the gallery and in such a prominent position. Uh, it was actually first given to the gallery by the Manchester Secular Society in 1911. Um, now, in a few moments, we're going to hear from Bob Forder, a man with a passion and enthusiasm, uh, to ensure that the achievements of secularists and free thinkers uh, who came before us are not forgotten. It's very easy. Uh, to write people out of history when they weren't popular. And that certainly has happened to Bradlaugh, but he's now being revived. And I'm very pleased to say that these two magnificent works of art in the House of Commons and here are available for people to see once more. But while we've been looking at the past, we, uh, we're also very much looking to the future. Many of you will have seen this week that Britain now has a non-religious majority Although the arguments for secularism are valid, whatever the religious makeup of society, it does provide an opportunity to question and challenge the religious privilege that still runs through British society and its institutions. My colleagues have been arguing all week in the media that the time has come to question religion's place in public life. We, re we recently published a, a manifesto for change, uh, copies of which are available here free of charge. Do take it away and read it. It's a very excellent document. Um, we're setting out what we think is the ideal policy response to Britain's changing religion and belief landscape. And each MP has received one of these. Whether or not they've read them is a different matter. With new threats to secularism emerging, particularly the um, menace of fundamentalist Islam, our work today is more important than ever. Yeah, yeah. And I'm pleased to say that the NSS's resolve and commitment to the cause remains undiminished. But for now, let's once more allow ourselves to look back into our rich history. And I introduce to you our resident uh, historian, Bob Forder, who's going to take it a little bit further. Bob. Um, what I'm trying to do, what I'm going to try and do uh, today, quite briefly, is to make a few comments designed to provide a context and a platform for Brian, who will speak more specifically about Charles Bradlaugh, his struggle to enter Parliament, and the Walter Sickert portrait we celebrate today. What I have to say will fall in three parts. 
First of all, I want to say a few words about the significance of this particular day, the 9th of September 2017. Second, I want to explain why I think it... I was never going to get that. <laughs> you said I had to do it at the end, not at the beginning. Second, I want to explain why it is uh, so fitting that we're meeting in Manchester, a city where I don't live, but did live for 10 years, and I, I have a passion for Manchester. I have to come back occasionally and get a fix. <laughs> it's a great city. And thirdly, and finally, I want to talk about one small artefact. <coughs> this gavel and what it tells us about Bradlaugh, the National Secular Society, and the British free-thinking, radical, or sceptical tradition. So first of all, today. Today is the 151st birthday of the National Secular Society, precisely on the dot. And hence it does mark on the dot, the end of the 150th anniversary day, day year. It's a bit of a coincidence, but there you are. <coughs> on the 9th of September, 1866, Bradlaugh published the Provisional Programme and Principles of the National Secular Society in his newspaper, The National Reformer, and proclaimed himself acting president. <laughs> pending a national conference. The national conference duly took place the next year in Bradford. So, congratulations and happy birthday to the National Secular Society. 1866 was quite a significant date in the sense that it is also the birth year of two other radical campaigning organisations, the Howard League and the Fawcett Society. I don't know whether that's just uh, coincidence that the three appear there, but marvellously, all three still exist today, and they're still doing their work. I think it's something of an honour that the National Secular Society can, sh can share its birthday with them, but I think it's probably worth adding that the National Secular Society certainly took quite recently perhaps post-Second World War, was a little different from the other two, and that it was primarily a working-class organisation. That's where it drew its membership and its strength from. And so I think, again, the National Secular Society is particularly interesting because it represents some of the first attempts to organise amongst the working class. Now the second section about Manchester, I need to put in a health warning. I don't live in Manchester, and I hope I've got these bits and pieces right. And I, I say that because I'm, I'm, I'm aware of how um, strong feeling is about this city. Mm -hmm. And please don't savage me if I miss important points or get it slightly wrong. The fact of the matter is that the Manchester branch of the National Secular Society was probably the biggest and most important branch outside London. And of course, in this city of liberty and freedom, secularism had very deep roots. Um, so that is important in itself. I've had absolutely no success in locating any sort of branch history. I have tried my best from a distance with the John Ryland's library, and I've tried my best with the Central Library. I was saying to a friend earlier today, I think what I really need to do is camp in Manchester for a week and start going through local history journals and things like that, and perhaps I will find something. But it is rather peculiar that no one has tried to write this up systematically. But there are a few fragments, and here we go. 
First of all, the branch was active from 1866 to 1913, though there were always schisms in the secularist movement. I'm afraid freethinkers are an argumentative lot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> And, and, of course, a huge schism in Bradlaw's time was, this, that was the difference of opinion over his publication of birth control literature in 1877. That divided, the movement still does divide it to some extent today, or the legacy of it. <coughs> the National Secular Society first, the, branch, the Manchester branch first occupied premises at 123 Grosvenor Street, Chalk non Medlock. But in 1881, it purchased a hall, a former chapel in Rushmore Street, which could seat over 500. The hall purchase was partly funded from the proceeds of three Charles Bradlaugh lectures that he donated to the society, and it was here that the portrait had its first hug. Two annual conferences of the National Secular Society were held in Manchester in 1876 and in 1890. The 1891 is the 1891's perhaps particularly significant in that it was the first conference after Bradlaugh's resignation. Abel Hayward, an important Manchester name. Abel Hayward was a trustee of the Rushmore Street Hall. We know he was involved with the secularist movement. Haywood was a <coughs> celebrated Manchester radical, chartist, publisher, and bookseller of Oldham Street, once imprisoned for his defiance of the stand -backs. He was fined, refused to pay the fine, and went to prison. <coughs> he was twice mayor of Manchester, was instrumental in the building of the Manchester Town Hall, and was mayor when it opened in 1877. Queen Victoria declined an invitation to attend the opening ceremony. A reason was never given, but it's assumed that she had no wish to be in the company of the mayor. And it's also perhaps worth noting that 1877 was the year when Bradhall published Fruits of Philosophy is pine the pioneering birth control tract. So it was in the news. Bradmore himself visited Manchester frequently, as with all the northern cities. For example, in 1871, he addressed a packed free trade hall on the topic, the impeachment of the House of Brunswick. His speech was later published as a pamphlet and became something of a radical Republican manifesto. To give you a flavour, here's the closing peroration of the printed version. I loathe these small German breasts for starred wanderers, whose only merit is their loving hatred of one another. In their own land they vegetate and wither unnoticed. Here we pay them highly to marry and perpetuate a pauper prince race. If they do nothing, they are good. If they do ill, loyalty gilds the vice until it looks like virtue. Thank goodness seems different today. <laughs> <laughs> finally, finally, bear in mind the Manchester branch only catered for the city. Edward Royal, who's written the definitive histories of secularism in the 19th century. He lists 32 secular societies in Lancashire in the 1880s. From time to time, these branches formed regional secular unions as well. Places like Stockport, Failsworth, Atherton, Tilsley, all had their own secular societies, as did all the, all the cotton towns. I move on to my third and final section. The gavel. 
<coughs> Deep in the bowels of the Conway Hall in Hoburn, that's London, <laughs> are the NSS officers. And in a cupboard, they keep the gavel. And I hope they take good care of it. On the 16th of February, 1889, a special NSS conference was called. And Aileen Bradlaugh, now overburdened with parliamentary work, had made his decision to resign as president and to propose George William Foote as his successor. When the moment came, he presented this gavel, this very one, to Foote, and said this. I tender the only emblem of office we have. This hammer, presented to us by the widow of James Watson, was used in the old rotunda, in days when such freedom as we now enjoy was impossible. Carlyle often used it. I give it to you joyfully, Foote, and trust you will hand it to your successor. And it's got some names inscribed on it, just on the metal end here. The first owner was Richard Carlyle, who spent more than 10 of his 53 years in jail. His crime was to publish and sell the works of Thomas Paine during the early 19th century and the years of repression. It's impossible to give a starting point to the radical free-thinking tradition, but we can't ignore the significance of Thomas Paine and writings such as The Rights of Man and The Age of Reason, which popularised secularist ideas. Not that they were called secularists then, Payne thought governments were there to benefit ordinary people, not at the convenience of monarchs. He called scorn on the idea of the divine right of kings and regarded reveal, revealed religion as a prop to authoritarian rule. These writings were published and sold by Carlyle, together with revolutions in France and North America, both of which Paine was active in, this struck terror into the heart of the British establishment and triggered a wave of repressive legislation generally known as Six Acts or Gag Acts. I need to mention, and I think this is quite important, that there's an interesting link between Manchester and Carlisle. Carlisle attended the mass meeting at St Peter's Fields on the 16th of August, 1819, that you're going to be celebrating shortly. And he was standing on the hustings with the main act, Orator Henry Hunt, when the yeoman recharged. Carlyle was due to speak after Hunt. After the, after the event, he returned to London and published the first issue of a new journal called The Republican. The Republican recorded was the first journal to record the events at St Peter's Fields. Some people, and I'm not sure of the evidence for this, because I've actually read through those first issues of The Republican, but some people claim <laughs> that it was Carlyle who coined the term Peter Lewis. <laughs> he certainly Rick was the first to record the event. A second name on the gavel is James Watson. Like Carlyle, a publisher, bookseller, free thinker, and London chartist, who worked closely with William Lovett, the leading moral force chartist. He also knew the inside of London's jails. Other names include Bradlaugh's own and those of his successor presidents, G.W. Foote and Chapman Cohen, both of whom served as presidents for a long, long time. Cohen was the longest serving. What I'm suggesting is that this gavel 
symbolizes a radical, free-thinking tradition and links the society of today all the way back to Thomas Paine. And I think that's pretty extraordinary. Bradlaugh was magnificent. And Brian will tell you how magnificent in a, in a moment. Brian was magnificent. Bradlaugh, Brian, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Bradlaugh was magnificent. But he was part of a tradition. He didn't come from thin air. He was just his generation's principal standard bearer for a tradition of a long and continuing history. In conclusion, I would suggest to you that popular history is inclined to be establishment history and ignores, or worse, takes the credit for the work and sacrifices and triumphs of those generally poor people who struggle for change. Some of us, and, and, and that, just before I say the next bit, I'm, I'm troubled actually that this morning uh, I was um, floating around Manchester and went to the People's History Museum. It's not enough, one mention of Bradlaugh in the People's History Museum, not a single mention. Pain just about gets a mention. The secularist tradition doesn't get a mention. I think there's some reasons for this, but this would take a long while to expand upon. But it's trouble. So some of us have to keep these traditions alive. Brian Niblett's highly readable biography of Brad Law does just that. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Bob, for a, an enlightening introduction there. Now we come to um, Professor Brian Niblett, who is the star of the show, and he's the author, as everybody knows now, of Dare to Stand Alone, the uh, biography, the definitive, as far as I'm concerned, biography of, of Bradlaugh. And not only is it uh, an important historical record of an unjustly neglected hero of the Victorian era, it's also a rollicking good story, and I think he's told it very well. And I'll be highly disappointed if they don't make a Hollywood miniseries out of it. <laughs> it's so dramatic. <laughs> so um, we're going to inaugurate now um, the Bradlaugh Lecture, which we hope will be an annual event. And so there's no better way to start this series than inviting Brian to talk about our founder and the eponymous Charles Bradlaugh. delighted to be here in Manchester. In the middle of the 19th century, when Charles Bradlaugh was active, Manchester was the greatest industrial city in the world. And every time I come to Manchester, which isn't very often, but when I do come, I get a sense of that history. I'm also delighted um, <coughs> to be in this Manchester art gallery for which I have a profound affection because it has this wonderful portrait of Charles Bradlaugh that was painted by Walter Sickert. And Charles Bradlaugh died in, um, in January 1891. Are you going to share that? Oh, there it is. Thank you very much. Um, and Charles Bradlaugh died in 1891, and this wonderful portrait uh, by Sickert is a posthumous portrait. Uh, a Manchester businessman who had much admiration for Charles Bradlaugh, he commissioned this portrait soon after Bradlaugh's death. He wanted to remain anonymous, we don't know who he was, but he donated it to 
the Manchester branch of the National Secular Society. Uh, he, uh, uh, in, in secret, by the way, um, I chose that portrait as the frontispiece to my book, and I'm very grateful to the, Mar to, to the Manchester Art Gallery and to um, uh, uh, the Sikhat Estate for allowing me to have um, that portrait as my frontispiece. The, the clothes that Bradlaugh is wearing there were actually the clothes which he used when he spoke at that bar to the House of Commons. They were, don they were donated by Hy um, Hypatia, his beloved and, and, and then his surviving daughter. Um, it was on the 26th of September in 1891 which is the anniversary of Bad Lord's birthday, that that, that portrait uh, was unveiled at a hall in Manchester where there was 600 people present. Charles Bradlaugh, whether he was alive or whether he was dead, attracted a large audience, as indeed he has this afternoon. And at that meeting, was George Foote on the platform, who was Bradlaugh's successor as the president of the National Secular Society, Hypatia, and Walter Sickert. Uh, Walter Sickert was chosen as the, um, as the artist because he'd already uh, 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 painted a head and shoulders of Charles Bradlaugh and, and, and a couple of drawings, and I've included all those uh, in my book. And at that meeting, George Foote unveiled the portrait, and, and, and George Foote gave a speech. And these are the last words he said. It was something to have taken his hand and looked into those great, strong, fearless, and yet gentle eyes. This picture will ensure that that Bradlaugh will have a life beyond the dust of death. Uh, a wonderful ending uh, to that speech, and Bradlaugh will always have a life beyond the dust of death. He will never be forgotten. He was the greatest backbencher of the 19th century. He was the greatest orator of the 19th century. He had amazing character, determination and persistence, and he's a hero who will never be forgotten. He was born on the 26th of September, uh, 1833, and he died on the uh, 30th of January, 1891. Only 57 years, but 57 years of achievement. He was an atheist, he was a Republican, and he was an advocate of birth control. To be one of those things in mid-Victorian England, was to be reviled. To be all three of them meant he was vilified, denigrated, maligned, and defamed. And it says a great deal for him that uh, he, was able to st uh, he was able to withstand that antagonism. He was um, unpopular with the general public. He was very unpopular with the press. He was, of course, unpopular with all the churches. He was unpopular with Queen Victoria because he was a Republican. But he had two pillars of support. One was, the, uh, uh, one was this National Secular Society, which we've been told he founded in 1866. There he was amongst friends. There he had supporters. The other pillar of support was the Burgesses of Northampton. He fought his first by-election in Northampton in, 1860, in, in 1868, and Bradlaugh was, uh, and Northampton was a wonderful constituency for him. It's in the middle of England. It was the centre of the boot and shoe industry, and that was a cottage industry. The, the people who, who made these boots and shoes, the uppers and the leathers, they were all self-employed. They were independent. They could be radical, and they were. And they supported Bradlaugh 
to, to the end. Now, he, um, he earned his living, Charles Bradlaugh, by public speaking. He was the greatest in public speaker of his time. He was six foot two inches high, he was very broad, he had an enormously thick chest, and he had a sonorous sound that could fill, uh, uh, that, that could fill a hall of over a thousand people. And he often had over a thousand people at his meetings. He was a master of rhetoric. He, he used all the rhetorical devices in his speech. He usually started quite slowly and quietly. But as he went on, he built up to, um, he built up to a great passion, and he ended always with a powerful, penetrating mm, peroration, which brought the audience to their feet. He was a remarkable speaker. Of course, rhetoric is not enough. You have to have compelling logic. And he did that. His speeches were meticulously prepared. He believed in his speeches in definition. He spoke like a lawyer. He was actually a, a, a very good lawyer, though he never qualified. But he spoke as a lawyer, and he believed in the importance of definition. This is one of the things he said. The atheist does not say there is no God, but he says, I know not what you mean by God. The word God is a sound conveying no clear and distinct meaning. I cannot war with the non-entity. I love that sentence. I cannot war with the non-entity. Let me just say a word about Bradlaugh's atheism. In my opinion, he understood atheism better than anyone. He not only, um, he, he was amongst other things a philosopher, and he gave a philosophical basis to atheism, which, which really hasn't been done as well as he did it. He understood that atheism was positive. It is theism which is negative. So the negative of a negative is a positive, and he understood that. And he had a better understanding, in my opinion, of atheism than the modern atheists, the Richard Dawkins, the Sam Harris, the late, um, the late Christopher Hitchens. He really understood the subject he was, was talking about. He said, atheism, properly understood, is in no wise a cold and barren negative. It is, on the contrary, a hearty, fruitful affirmation of all truth, and involves a positive assertion and action of highest humanity. He, he fought three by-elections in Northampton and lost. Not by much, but he lost. It was in 1880, that great swing to the Liberals, the beginning of Gladstone's second administration, that Charles Bradlaugh actually won his seat in Northampton. And that was a triumph. But it was a triumph that gave rise to five and a half years of constitutional and political and legal strife. Every member of parliament has to declare his allegiance to the crown. And Bradlaugh wanted to affirm. A select committee of the House was formed, and they decided that he could not affirm. So he said, right, well, for my constituents, I will swear the oath, even though there are words in that oath that are idle and meaningless. He meant those four monosyllabic, imprecative words, so help me God. A second select committee of the House of Commons was formed to, this, uh, to consider whether he could swear the oath, and they also ruled against him. And it was in 1880, the 22nd of June, 1880, that a resolution was proposed and passed by the House of Commons. It was proposed by Sir Harding Gifford, the most distinguished lawyer of his time, 
and an implacable opponent of Bedlaw's. That motion was proposed by Sir Harding Gifford, and it was passed by the House of Commons. And it provided that Bradlaugh could neither affirm nor take the oath, and therefore he could not take his seat. And there followed five and a half years of struggle. There were three by-elections in Northampton. Charles Bradlaugh was imprisoned only for one night, but he was imprisoned in the clock tower in those five and a half years. The last person ever to be imprisoned in the clock tower. He won a very important case, Clark against Bradlaugh, which asserted that he had voted in the House of Commons uh, without swearing the oath. He fought that case. His opponent was Sir Harding Gifford. He lost it in the Court of First Instance. He lost it in the Court of Appeal, but he won it in the House of Lords. He proved himself a better lawyer than the most distinguished lawyer of his time. During those uh, five and a half years, he was prosecuted for blasphemy. He represented himself and he was acquitted. And the prosecuting lawyer was um, Sir Harding Gifford. During those five and a half years, he was forcibly ejected from the House of Commons, violently ejected by 12 policemen. His arm was damaged and it never really recovered. But during those five and a half years, he gave four magnificent speeches at the bar of the House of Commons. What happened was that the sergeant at arms withdrew that octagonal bar from the tube which held it and, and, and put it across, and Bradlaugh standing there is symbolically just outside the house. And he made four magnificent speeches from there. And those speeches moved the house, even though they were saying he couldn't take his seat. In one of those speeches he said, if I'm not fit for my constituency, for my constituents, they shall dismiss me. But you, looking around at the 600 MPs, never shall. The, um, the grave alone shall make me yield. Wonderful statement that, the grave alone shall make me yield. And at one time, there was a legend at the bottom of that portrait which said, the grave alone shall make me yield. In the final one of those four speeches, he said, this house being strong should be generous. The strong can receive, the generous can give, but my constituents have a right to more than generosity. They have a right to justice. The law gives me my seat. In the name of the law, I ask for it. So, one man against 600. And his determination, his persistence, the quality of his oratory slowly changed the mood against him. The public ceased to be so violently against him. Some of the press um, supported him. He was beginning, uh, to, to, uh, beginning to be respected. And it was in um, 1885, the general election of that year, that a new speaker was appointed to the House of Commons. Uh, he, he was elected to the House, uh, he, he was elected as speaker. And that was Arthur Wellesley Peel, who was a son of the great Robert Peel, the Prime Minister. And Sir Arthur Peel had common sense. He understood that this constitutional problem had to be solved. And so, before, at the beginning of the Parliament, before MPs swore the oath, he got up and he said, we are assembled in a new Parliament. I know nothing of the resolutions of the past. They have lapsed. They are void. And um, at, at that point, he allowed Charles Bradlaugh to swear the oath. So, Brad, so, so Charles Bradlaugh could move from outside the bar to inside the House of Commons and take his seat. 
two select committees, a night in the clock tower, ma a magnitude of debates, repeated by elections at Northampton, four great speeches at the bar, and this new speaker had the sense to allow Barrow to swear the oath and take his seat. And then he proved an amazingly effective backbencher. He was diligent, he made constant attendance at the House of Commons. The quality of his contribution made him a highly respected member, not only in his own party, the Liberal Party, but in the Conservative Party too. He had several great achievements in the House of Commons. He introduced a private member's bill which abolished perpetual pensions. He was always against any form of hereditary privilege, and that was passed by the House of Commons. He, by using a private member's bill, he abolished the truck system. That was the system where employers, instead of paying their employees in cash, they gave them vouchers, which could be exchanged at the employer's shop. He abolished that. That was a great achievement. He was very fond of India, Charles Bairdall, he had a great fascination for the Indian continent, those country of 250 million people that was governed by the House of Commons in England, uh, a third of the way around the world. And he supported India. He was known in the House of Commons as the member for India. Of course, he wanted India to become independent, but he realized that was too soon. So, so what he did is he fought for the senior levels in the administration to be held by Indians. And Indians loved him, and they still do. He's still remembered in India. There are memorials to Badlaw, both in India and in Pakistan. He was, he was loved by both the Muslims uh, and the Hindus. But his greatest achievement in Parliament was the Oaths Act of um, 1888. And the evidence of his support, of the way that MPs respected him, is the way they passed that Oaths Act. What the Oaths Act did was to provide that anyone who is required to swear an oath may instead make a solemn affirmation. It solved the problem that Bradlaugh had, of course, but it solved the problem that every free thinker had if, 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 if they objected to swearing the oath. They could instead make a solemn affirmation. And that Oaths Act was passed very easily in the House of Commons. And it was passed in the House of Lords. Even the Archbishop of Canterbury supported the Oaths Act. There was one member of the House of Lords who voted against it. And that was Sir Harding Gifford, <laughs> who by then had become the Earl of Horsburgh. Of course, the Charles Bradlaugh having found, having founded the National Secular Society, he loved that organisation. There he was amongst friends. There he made his best speeches because there was no opposition to him. He was amongst friends. He could be intimate with the members. He called them my fellow heretics. And he said the word heretic should be a term of honour. He was always a supporter of free speech. He depended on free speech. And he always supported it. He said to the National Secular Society, one of their meetings, without free speech, no search for truth is possible. Better a thousandfold abuse of free speech than denial of free speech. He defined and free thought, which he called the enfranchisement of the human mind, freeing it from the trammels of old legends, which the ignorance of some, the credibility of some, the fraud of some, will, like the constrictor, cramp and cripple the brains with hopelessness. He was very um, much against the Christian Beatitudes particularly that one which, said, which says, 
Blessed are the poor in spirit. Is poverty of spirit among the virtues? Is it a virtue at all? Manliness of spirit, honesty of spirit, fullness of rightful purpose. These are virtues. Poverty of spirit is a vice. Now, now Charles Bradley was not a man who was given to weeping. But he did weep in public on one occasion. That was in 1890, when, as we've been told, because of ill health, he decided he had to cease being the president of the National Secular Society. And at that meeting in 1890, he spoke in favour of his successor, George William Foote, who was really the only possible successor to him. He was a good writer, he was a good speaker, he'd earned his spurs by serving 12 months in prison for blasphemy. And as Charles, as Charles Bernal got up to speak, the tears came down. They splashed upon his notes for almost a minute. But he drew himself together and then he passed, as, as we've heard, the gavel the hammer to George Foote. That was uh, a remarkable occasion. Charles Bradlaugh's death was poignant. He always wanted that the resolution of the 22nd of June 1880 to be expunged from the records of the House. On the 27th, of January 1891, he lay dying of Bright's disease and he was in a coma. But a few weeks before, he set down a resolution in the House of Commons to expunge that resolution of the 22nd of June, um, 1880. And it was supported by Gladstone on behalf of the Liberal Party, and by W. H. Smith, the leader of the House of Commons, on behalf of the Conservative Party. And that resolution to expunge was passed. Not unanimously, but no one voted against it. The message was given immediately to his daughter Hypatia, but she couldn't arise him from his consciousness. So, lying on his deathbed there, Charles Bradlaugh achieved something that was profoundly important to him, but he never knew it. The, the preeminent causes that Bradlaugh had were atheism, republicanism, and birth control. And all three of those are linked by a thread. The fundamental right and duty of individual judgment, based on reason, exercised by the individual on his own behalf. What, what bad law wanted to do was to remove the fetters from man's mind. And the fetters were faith, represented by the priesthood and the church, and force, represented by the crime. And that essentially was why he was an atheist and a republican. He had a life of achievement. Those 57 years achieved a lot, but there's still a lot to do to support the causes the battle sought. If Bradlaw were to come in this room this afternoon, he would be amazed that we still have in England an established church. If Bradlaw were to come in this room this afternoon, he would, shock, he would be shocked that we still have a monarchy. He thought it would end with Queen Victoria. If Bradlaugh came in this room this afternoon, he would be astonished that we still house, have a House of Lords. He was against any form of proprietary privilege, of hereditary privilege. And, Chairman, if Charles Bradlaugh were to come in this room this afternoon, he would be delighted 
at the portrait <laughs> that Sickard had painted of him. And he would be grateful to the Manchester Art Gallery for the care they've given it and the prominent way they are displaying it. <laughs>